Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is mixer Gary Lux. First of all, there's been a lot of growth worldwide in the music industry, and this data comes from the IFPI Annual Global Music Report. That's the International Federation of Phonographic Industry. Yes, it's an old-fashioned name, but in fact, the IFPI does collect all of the data for the entire recorded music business worldwide. And the latest report found a number of interesting things. First of all, there was a lot of growth, higher growth than anywhere else in South America last year. The music industry there grew by 18%. 49% of that was from streaming. And in Asia, it grew by 5%. China also now entered the top 10 in terms of the biggest grossing countries in the world. Now, why do I bring those up? The interesting part in all this is the fact that these are all of the sectors of the world that previously had a lot of piracy. So streaming music is doing what everyone expected it to do, and that's killing piracy. And we can see it just in the growth that's happening in these particular regions of the world. Now, when we look at the countries that have the top revenue in the music industry, it's been pretty much the same for a long time now. The U.S., of course, is number one. Japan is number two. That's always a surprise. Germany is number three, and the U.K. is number four. And again, China now is number 10, and that's kind of the surprise out of all this. The biggest problem in the music business right now? Well, as most people see it, it's YouTube, believe it or not. The reason why is last year it paid out $856 million in royalties to the music industry. But that's a drop in the bucket considering that it has five times more users than all of the music streamers put together. So, in fact, it's a service that really isn't pulling its weight in terms of the amount of money it's paying back to the music industry. And again, the industry looks at it as the major problem in the music world right now. That being said, you have to understand that as well as the music industry seems to be doing, it's still only back to about 60% of the market peak of 1999. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Check out my Hitmakers Club for access to the private Mixers Facebook group, monthly deconstructed hits, mixing workshop and Q&A webinars for a short time, access to my core training module bonus. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. Now, there's some confusion. When you go to buy an audio interface for your computer, there's a host of of interface formats that you can choose from, and it's not always clear which one is the best. So for instance, there's USB 2.0, USB 3.0, USB Type-C, Thunderbolt 2, or Thunderbolt 3. So which one is best? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you're only gonna do a couple channels at a time, it really doesn't matter. USB 2 works fine, as does USB 3.0. Difference between them is the fact that USB 3 has a lot more room for data. And because of that, it means that you can do higher resolution and a lot more channels of it. So that's a big thing right there. It's a lot faster. USB Type-C, which is the latest one, basically describes the plug shape. And it's a smaller plug than a normal USB plug that we've been used to for a long time. And it's also rotationally symmetrical. It means it doesn't matter how you plug it in. Either way, it's going to work. And it's smaller. The big thing is there's a very high power delivery. About 100 watts it will do. And USB 2.0 and 3.0 would only do about 2.5 watts. So that means that you can power a lot of things off of USB Type-C. So that's important. We're also starting to find it on more and more peripherals and computers. So you're seeing it on laptops. You're seeing it on drives, tablets, phones. It's a really good thing. Of course, Apple has been really big on Thunderbolt for quite a while, and we've evolved from Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3. What's the difference? Well, higher bandwidth. Thunderbolt 2 was 20 gigabits per second, and Thunderbolt 3 is 40 gigabits per second. But the thing that most people don't realize is Thunderbolt is basically USB-C. It's a subset of USB Type-C. 
So they basically have the same specs for the most part. Thunderbolt was out in the market a little bit earlier, but it's really the same thing when it comes down to it. Now there's a lot of interesting things here when it comes to Thunderbolt and USB-C. For instance, all Thunderbolt cables also work as USB type C cables. The shorter the cable, the higher the speed. So if, when you start to get long cables, you're basically going to lower your speed and lower the amount of data that you can push through it. There's also two different types of cables, which is why they're so expensive. There's an active cable, meaning it needs power. There's electronics in the ends, and there's passive cables. What's the difference? Well, the active cables will actually give you that 40 gigabit per second bandwidth, while the passive cables are limited to 20 gigabits per second. So when it comes down to it, you're probably better off if you can do USB type C, because we're going to see more and more of that on all of our computers and all of our peripherals in the future. But if you really have to choose a simple interface without a lot of channels, it doesn't really matter which interface you choose because they're all going to work. Gary Lux is one of Hollywood's premier music mixers with literally thousands of projects to his credit with major artists like Usher, Keith Urban, Sting, Ben Harper, Janet Jackson, and Rob Thomas. Before going independent in 1988, Gary was the head music mixer for Universal Studios, where he garnered two Emmy Award nominations for his work with the Jacksons and Frank Sinatra. We spoke via Skype from a studio in the outskirts of Los Angeles. I always like to find out about the background, and I don't know much about your background. I, I mean, I, I know about Universal, but I don't know back to the beginning. How did you get into this crazy business? Well, I, I, I was always a musician, and so, but my first... My first start with studios is in 1978 at Evergreen Studios. I was a gopher. That's that's where I started. And uh, one week I'm I'm watching a movie in the Magnolia Movie Theater, and then the next week we're busting the place apart and uh, and built it, and it became Evergreen Studios. And I was the gopher. I ran for lunch. I ran for nails. I ran for everything. Until the studio opened, and then I was uh, then I was on the stage crew. Wow! Uh, setting it up and tearing it down. So, I, you know, I was kind of lucky to get a real, you know, commercial studio formulative type of education, which is you know a throwback. It's you now maybe maybe one of the few last years of of being able to you know do that in a commercial studio. So I I, I was on the stage crew, and then. Uh, and I became an assistant engineer. And then at Evergreen, in six years, I assisted over a hundred mixers. Wow! And then, uh, and then, and then, Universal Studios was closed for some time because they built Stage Ten. They put in a new Neve in there, and all the shows came to Evergreen, and I mixed them. And they took me back over to Universal. So that's how I, I got my job. So really from six years of being a gopher, six, from six years of, you know, gopher to head music mixer at Universal, that was, so you can imagine what type of education I really got, you know, because everything at the time was, was smoking hot. I mean, three sessions a day, jingles, TV, movies, day and night, you know, so, you know, I got a real broad education in everything. Well, Evergreen especially was one of the few independent scoring stages. That's correct. Sure, sure. So, you know, us and Group 4 at the time were the independent. And uh, so we did quite a fair share of, you know, TV and movies and, uh, you know, uh, quite an education. The old Evergreen is actually in my neighborhood. I can walk to it. I'm really close. Yeah, I've actually, I'm, you know, actually heartbroken on the turn of events that it's that it's become because the, even these owners and the ones before, I was in contact with them. Um, they said they wanted to bring Evergreen back to its heyday. So I said, that was the mandate at the time. I said, well, you can't do it without me because, you know, I know everything about this and I wanted to do it. Um, I was looking forward to running the place and, you know, um, uh, teaching and doing and having a good intern program and really making it, but it, it didn't work out that way. I ultimately think they're going to knock that place down. Really, the, the property is too valuable. 
Yeah, and it would be a real shame to lose it, although it's not like it used to be, and that's the problem, because once it changed the first time, it wasn't going to ever go back to the way it was, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we started this, when we started the studio, it, everything was so important to us. I, I felt, you know, coming from New York, I, I felt we were the New York Yankees. I mean, I really, everything was so important. Every session we did was the most important. That's the way I took it. And I, you know, I embraced it. And, you know, that's the way, you know, it's the reason why I had that kind of education. You were lucky there because you got an education on a big stage and both recording and mixing. So you got both sides. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, truly from Gopher to, you know, mixing product for Universal and lots of other things. And then uh, and then I left Evergreen and, you know, became head scoring mixer for a very short amount, of, I mean, almost three years at Universal. When you were at Universal, were you just mixing? Uh, no, I was scoring. I was doing all the TV shows. No, I did all the scoring and I did scoring. At the time, we were doing amazing stories uh, Steven Spielberg. So we got a, you know, we got a Hollywood film score, you know, legends every week, you know, for a TV show and Simon and Simons. And, and I, I just the murder, she wrote and, you know, tons of that. And then everything Mike post, which was Hill street, wise guy, Hunter, LA law, you know, I, I did it all with Mike. Wow. And then when you left there, did you go to the 5.1 at that time? No. Once I became independent, then I was still doing a lot of Mike Post things at Group 4. I did a lot of work with Harold Wheeler. That We did a lot of movies, and uh, he's done the Academy Awards now and stuff. So I, I did a lot of stuff with him. Uh, Jackson's, Jackson's Family Honors, that was a, a mini series I did with Harold. And it's, but So in my independent career, I did a lot of stuff at Group 4. Because yeah. that's you know, Angel there and Dennis, they, they embraced us and... Uh, it was always great being there. When you first started, most of the stuff was still in stereo, right? When I first started, we were mixing TV shows in mono. And then then we did a stereo three-channel mag, left and right, with a discrete somewhat center. We'd put percussion in it. Then we started you know, going to mag and, and four-track, um, and with stereo then. But when I first started, we first started scoring these, we, most things were in mono. Tell me about the transition that went from stereo to surround. Oh, well, so for me, you know, so I, this was now fast forwarding into the 90s. I started at Evergreen in 78, went to Universal in 85 to 88, then was freelance. And we didn't start, we didn't start 5.1 in the surround stuff till 98, 99 when that that happened and that was just that was that was fantastic for me because i got to work on some really great blue chip projects i did i did all of the big fat band yeah. with gordon goodwin and and uh aaron neville i did two albums with him and i remember the aes shows when 5.1 first started all of my music was in all over the aes shows yeah and that was kind of a thrill. Ken Calais was a partner at the time. He was doing rumors and uh, it was a great time being able to get original multi-track things and then mixing them in surround. So that was really something. Let's go back a little further though. When you were still mixing television, when you started to get asked to do things in surround, what was that like? Because the tools weren't quite ready, as I recall, right? Well, well what happened was, is that I I became partners with John Trickett, who became who was the president of 5.1 Entertainment. We joined with Leo Rossi and Ken Calais that were in it and a, a CD uh, advanced uh, program. And so I wasn't getting asked to do things in 5.1. I joined the company, and and that's when you know, when when home theater systems were really big. That's when the DVD audio wars <laughs> was you know really started and sure. so so uh i remember when when i mixed the it, swinging for the fences for for gordon and you know he did it in stereo tommy vicari had tracked it and, and does all of his stuff and so we had signed gordon and i mixed it in 5.1 and 
I remember the first time he heard it, he, w- he he got up and was ready to walk out the door. I had the trombones on the left. I had all the saxes on the right, trumpets in front, rhythm section, except the drums, you know, everywhere. Because it wasn't dictated by picture. It was just my, a soundscape, you know, type of thing. So um, yeah, I grabbed Gordon. I said, sit down, Gordon. You have, you know, you have to lead the charge here in, in this format. And so, uh, yeah, the tools were not... We're, we're not up to speed, and, and you know, either was I. I. I heard a lot of stuff that Elliot Shiner had done um, and blew me away, yeah. you know, what the, what the options were at the time. So a lot of trial and error on becoming an expert at it, in, and I had done, you know, hundreds of albums in that, during that time. It was a kick. I got to tell you, musically, it was really, it was really a really cool thing. But a lot of times, Bobby... When I had to mix the stereo and the five one, I would do the stereo first and then derive the five one out of that. Sure. Well, that seems to be the best way to do it. You get that mix first, and well, because a lot of the projects that I do, and I did all the Janet Jackson stuff, I did Sting, and so I like on the Janet Jackson, and I mixed Usher's eighty seven oh one. So, but then I didn't mix the stereo on those. But I used the stereo as a guide. And so I kind of referenced the stereo often because, you know, these are internationally acclaimed known pieces. So I didn't want to have to totally reinvent the wheel. But at the same time, I had to make it my own. In your studio now, do you do mostly mixing to picture? No, I, I mostly do. I, I mostly do music. I'm, oh. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, record stuff, uh, producing artists um, and the TV stuff that I that I do. I'm. I'm not using picture sometimes, not as much, certainly not doing anything in 5.1 surround anymore, although I'm prepared for it. I haven't done it in quite some time. Yeah, it's funny that the demand for that just dropped off a cliff. Well, it was the, you know, the DVD audio and the Super Audio CD was really the last hard disk system that we really shoved down the consumer's throat. Yeah. And then from there, it went to MP3s and everyone was able to have, you know, have a thousand pieces of music on, on their iPod. And it was, you know, music by convenience. So it didn't work out for, you know, the audio. I mean, the big problem was the fact that it was difficult to get consumers to not only buy a system, but then to place it and calibrate it correctly. Well, and, and then not only that, we had to ask them to buy a DVD audio player. So we would play 96K because AC3 at the time wasn't, <laughs> it was what we had to facilitate for the video systems. Yeah. So we, it was a, it was a great thing for me because I got to work on some really incredible projects, but eventually that format, you know, did fizzle out. The way I remember it was all of a sudden it went from, okay, you're making a good amount of money doing this. And then for the same work, you're getting paid about a third. (laughs) And then it was hardly any work doing it any longer. So it was just, you know, one of those things that fell off the cliff. From 5.1, I, I moved on and I, and I started working for another company that was, uh, that was shooting concerts really all over the world. So I was capturing these things for a DVD for the groups or video, you know. So I, was, I continued to mix and surround for quite some time for video format things. So, Were you recording was, those as well? I recorded them too, yeah. Okay, so tell me about how you did that. I'm curious in that you were going into this knowing that you're going to mix it and surround. Did you approach it any differently or was it just like the hall that you approached? Actually, no. You know, I'll, I'll use I'll use like uh, Ben Harper at the Apollo as a as a good example because uh, that was it was fantastic being there. It was fantastic being with Ben. You know, typically we took everybody on stage, you know, one for one channel per channel as we would do it. And uh, many microphones are out in the in the audience, of course. And so, um, so the answer to the question, there isn't anything that we did differently recording them for it to be in five one for a concert. It was built in. You had things that would go in the rear that were more ambient. And because it was picture you, if the guitar player, you saw the guitar player in the front left, I wasn't going to put him in the back, right? Because that yeah, sure. disoriented. So as opposed to DVD audio, where you had no picture to dictate what you were doing, then it was a it was just a sound picture scape, you know, for my own, you know, my own artistry. So, you know, because it had no picture. 
Um, so, I, you know, I get asked, I, I, I have gotten asked this question many, many times through the years. And for me, for stereo, as in 5.1, discrete mono recording works out best for everything. That's the way I mm. see it. You know, because you, you want a guitar off to the left, you, everything can't be recorded left, right, left, right, left, right. It just sums in the middle. There's no discrete. So if I, you know, I, I, I'm always doing discrete information. So things are not leaking into each other. And I've been pretty consistent with how I do that in stereo, as it were, for surround. You know. Let me ask you a question about your audience, mics, because everybody has a different technique of doing this. What was your setup? Or, or did it change because you were in a different location, a different hall, for instance, or a different venue? Or did you have the same approach all the time? Pretty much I would use, I'd use eight microphones. And so, you know, I always wanted something that was short uh, so that I at least got a good throw from the speakers themselves. And then, you know, cascading, depending upon, I've been in tennis stadiums and I've been all over the place and and at the Apollo, and you just kind of, it's a feel thing. And, and they're they are matched in pairs and layers, uh, front, a little further back, even further back from that. And so, you know, just to get some coverage. Tell you the truth, Bobby, a lot of the times, you know, when I had um, audience microphones, I would group them all and I would move them. I'd move them forward and backwards, you know, depending upon most of the time, it was forward because the, the you know the microphones were you know two three five hundred millisecond delays and if I yeah. wanted to use them or even less of them I still moved them forward to time them a little better with the band I still had the ambience but I didn't certainly didn't want it to sound like a ricochet I was always uh, you know moving things to time the audience to you know to the band on stage were you using stereo mics or just match pair just match pairs I think it was at yeah. the time I used. Earthworks, they were really cool mics, and mm -hmm. I had uh, actually I had twelve of them. And so, uh, you know, depending upon how, you know, how deep the the stadium or whatever was, was how many I used. Tell me about your studio. When did you transition into your own studio? We all transitioned, you know, by by you know by need. Um, you know, I'm in my I'm in my living room dining room right now. I'll, I'll after we're done here, I'll kind of. I'll move things around so you can see. I have a, uh, I have an S6 um, console, uh, HDX system, um, and I've had the S6 for quite some time, for quite a few years, and uh, it's grooving now. I suffered for a while. The, you know, the <laughs> hardware was 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 really pretty, and the lights were really nice, but the software wasn't really caught up to you know, us users that were demanding, because at, at the time when Digital Design and Avid, you know, amalgamated and came together, they said that this was going to be a replacement for the icon. And so the first thing I said, okay, show me VCA spill. <laughs> and it wasn't there. So I said, yeah. okay, so what am I supposed to do now? You know, I, I really liked the, the D commands, the D controls that they had. They were very musical at the time. But I have an S6, uh, 16 fader, M10. It's nice. I like it. It's really compact. You know, I don't have to move anywhere. Um, and I'm on you... Pro Tools 2018.3. You know, I'm right up there. Because now, of course, with the S6, you know, the consoles, the bloodline is tied to the software. So yeah. I, have to stay, uh, I have to stay current on the software. And I also have to do it to stay relevant in this business. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> what monitors are you using? Well, I'm I'm probably using the I'm using a hybrid type of system. I'm using uh, out of the UK. I'm using Flare Audio. I'm using their X2. Um, I have satellites with a an 18 inch sub, and it's a three way system. And there's a lot of DSP in the in this um, amplifier that I have. And they are a famous PA company. Before I had these, I had, um, uh, what were those? The SM9s, the uh, Focal as SM9s. But, but even before that, my favorites were the Westlake BBS M6s. I had those. Yeah, I yeah. had five pairs of those because I, was in, I did a lot of that in surround. So I needed many of those. 
Um, and then I moved to the powered speaker, the Focal, and the first day that this flare system walked in the door, the Focals were off and they're gone. But it's a PA. It's really a PA, and I just, it's, it's just, I love it. The problem is, is that it's, you know, uh, if something happens to these, I'm out of luck because there's, there's nothing in this, in this town that's going to be able to, you know, replace these parts or fix these things. Um, but I've, I've made a decision on what's going to be next for me. And for me, it's going to be the Amphions. Um, so that's where I'm going. Um, I've listened, I listened to, I listened to the keys. I, I mean, I, I thought those were incredibly cool. I just thought there was just too much DSP to make that work. The Amphions, um, I've, I've had my eye on them for some time. I was over at Dave Pensado's place. He's got, uh, He's got the system that I would probably get, all those, although I'd have more subs than him. Um, and I was just over there a couple of weeks ago just listening. But that's probably, that's probably my next move soon. It's funny you should mention that. I was just tracking at a place that had the Amphions. I was really impressed. Boy, they sounded good. And, and you know, Bob, it's, it's, it's really funny. Every time, you know, we, we've listened to 8 million speakers the, the thing is, is that on my speaker system that I have now, the sweet spot is probably about three and a half inches wide. And so anybody <laughs> that anytime I move and I walk away and I go to take a drink of water, or I go to do something else, you know, you hear things differently. And now I judge speakers by how I can move up, move wide, nothing and move around on the outside and nothing changes. So the, really the yeah. dispersion PMC has got that kind of dispersion going on too. Um, um, but I'm I'm a big fan of these Amphions, the uh, the two eighteen models. Let's talk a little bit about your approach to mixing. You do a lot of different projects and a lot of different genres, a lot of different types. Do you approach a mix the same way, regardless what it is, or does the genre of music or the format or anything make a difference to you? You know, it it really doesn't. You know, I I, you know, I have a sound like you have a sound. I always say if 10 mixers mix the same song, the only thing that you'd have at the other end is to still be in the same key, you know, because we <laughs> all impact things differently. I'm a bass player, so I'm fundamentally, you know, weighted on the bottom, and that's where my confidence and my mixing really comes from. Um, and so I, I know what it's going to sound like at the end. Not sure how we always get there, but I, I approach things pretty much the same, but it evolves all the time. And I must say that I have a posse of young guys that I, that I rely heavily on as they rely on me, um, to keep me contemporary. And then of course I keep them hip. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a, you know, a group of guys that I have over to my place often and we have barbecues and we share information and uh, whether it's plugins or techniques or things like that. I'm ever evolving, Bobby. I, I, you know, I, I used to do things, you know, a certain way and, you know, I, I, I still hear things the same, but how I get there now for me, I feel is so exciting and more efficient. And I really love the tools. You know, I, I, I really dig them. I'm glad you mentioned that you're a bass player. What I've noticed mixers that started out on bass really have a different sound. And what it is, and I don't know if it's a subconscious thing that you think about the bass more. Do you start from the bass and build around it? You know, I'll put up, I'll put up the drums, I'll put up bass, and then I'll probably put up either the piano and a guitar and get, you know, a basic four piece, three piece rhythm section. And, you know, I'll get it smoking and I'll put the vocal in. And that's when the vocal, I may have 75 other tracks, but my lead vocal is going in really, really quickly. You know, I, yeah. you know, when I, when I do lectures, some kids, you know, I tell them, you know, you can slam this up and make everything sound great. And all of a sudden you got no room for the lead vocal. So my yeah. lead vocals go in quickly. And so it's heavily weighted with how big my drums get. And the, you know, the, 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 the impact of the vocal has to be there. So the bass is in there you know, as well. And I know for a lot of mixers, you know, it's their source of source of anxiety. Do I have enough bass? Do I, you know, how do I have? And I think that that's, you know, that's most mixers. I don't have that problem because the amount of bass that I put in has to, 
has to match how loud everything else has to be. So it's you know very evenly weighted for how I kind of pop things out. Yeah, I get that. But here's the thing about bass, though. It's level versus tonality. And sometimes if you have the tonality, you don't need as much level because it fits in the mix better. And you being a bass player, you may have a better feel for what that tone is supposed to well, be. Well, the bass is actually, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's kick bass because the kick is the impact, of course, and, yeah. and, and the bass itself is the extension of the kick. So, you know, the frequencies that I'll add to the kick to make it a little bigger, I subtract from the bass itself. I do a, I do more high pass filtering on these kicks and, and basses these days because I just don't need 20, 30 cycles and, and rumble and width and bloat. So the tightness really comes from where does that kick have to sit and where does the extension of the bass push out of? Actually, I was I was over at Pensados. He went crazy. I played a bunch of things for him. He goes, "How do you? Where do you get this? You know, this bass sound from and stuff." I and I said, "This just you know." I said, "If you know, you're a guitar player. All you're going to hear in your mix is guitar." Yeah. <laughs> I said, and that would be terrible. <laughs> so you know, it's 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 how you brought up. It's how you perceive things. Again, you know, ten mixers can have ten different approaches to the mix, and you know. So that's just, and it's become my confidence, you know, a punchy mixer, you know, not as, not as echoey to keep the punch of things going. And then of course things are orchestral and then, you know, you, you do things differently, of course. Do you have any plugins that you're going to use every mix that are just go-to plugins that yeah, always work? You know, so when I do have my template, you know, we have to have to build a console. We have to be able to start reaching for something. Um, my number one EQ is the fab filter EQ and that's, mm, a, that's yeah. at my top line, um, for so many reasons. And the fact that it has 24 nodes that you can deal with really helps me, you know, I do more subtractive, um, EQing Bobby than I do additive, you know, being able to hear things at a time, hearing harshness in the, in the upper mid range. So I'm, you know, I might have some EQs that are, very close to each other and as I'm dipping them because I'm hearing a vocal, you know, whistling at three and a half K or, you know, or a little louder. So fab filter, that's my, that's my first line. And then I, I really do like, um, the active EQs. Um, and so, um, I'm using uh, neutron by isotope mm. and I'm, I'm kind of big with, with isotope. Uh, I'm on their advisory and I, I, I love their stuff. Uh, so I, I remember when I first did my first all neutron mix when it first came out and I just used the neutron and stuff. So it's very cool and it's a great tool. And I do like the active EQ section of it. And I do like active EQs. You know, there's been other ones as well. And I find myself doing a lot less compressing overall on the track when I'm going for specific, you know, frequencies that I'm looking to, you know, to compress. So, um, that's usually my first line, you know, the, the EQ and then an active EQ, a dynamic EQ, you a mean, dynamic right? EQ. Yeah. Active, yep. EQ, yeah. Di active dynamic. Do you have a template for effects? In other words, effects that you're always going to start with? Yeah. So, you know, I'll have a, you know, I'll have a, you know, three, three chambers. One will be whatever the plate times out to be. And I determine that when I play the drums and, so I time out the plate and then I'll have other EQs that'll, that start getting more specific and they're probably longer EQs. I'll use a, you know, a, a harmonizer for some pitch and I'll have some delay and stuff going on. But for the vocal, so that's where I'll include most things in the, in the band. But for the vocals, inside my VCA, I have its own plate, its own long reverb, uh, you know, a little pitch delay um and some uh you know about six or seven things that i have on the vocal channel that i that i'm ready to call on decapitators and you know stuff to add some you know some uh, analog sound to since you do so many different things what's the most fun you know i'm i'm still the, the you know the maybe the naive optimist i i really love i really love creating music 
and I really love doing doing this. You know, I have no patience for many, many things. My wife can't believe that I could sit and, you know, cycle four bars and just stay with it. She goes, I don't know how you do it. You have no patience for anything else. But, you know, once I start digging in, I, I just I just love it. Um, I, I love I love what we do. We don't do as much of it as we as we used to. And, uh, you know, that's another story. But I think the tools that we have, Bobby, are are spectacular. Unfortunately, um, because we're really not in commercial studios anymore, bound to a you know big two inch machine, um, the tools are great. But it's really for me, it's made mediocrity malignant throughout the industry because it's it's easy to it's easy to produce something. It's it's difficult to be great, and it's even more difficult to be undeniable. And so, yeah. you know, it's the tools for me, I love them because you and I, we used to take tape apart. Undo is a beautiful button for us in Pro Tools. Yeah. So, you know, and if you, if you came from that mindset of how you used to do things on the fly and rolling tape in and timing things out and, you know, just being a forensic mixer like that, having these tools, you know, having that foundation really, really does help. But, you know, it's made a lot of, home producers and, you know, budgets for composers have to deliver their own mixes. You know, they're great writers, but they're, you know, lousy mixers, but they have to fit it into a budget that, um, you know, works for them. That's the sad part of the business. The, yeah. The budgets these days. Yeah. Yeah. So in my studio, I, so right now I said my, my, one of my marketing things is I charge very little for mixing and recording. I charge an enormous amount for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't want to pay for mixing, you don't want to pay, fine. But I'm going to kill you at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I love Each it. Great <laughs> <time>. <laughs> All right, Gary, last question. Yeah. What's the best piece of business advice that maybe you learned along the way or somebody might have imparted to you? You know, Bobby, we came from, you know, we coming from being a gopher, you know, it's so cliche. You know, I, I when I was at Evergreen, I started I had to put in 90 hour weeks. I got to pay it $151.04. I remember the check because it's a really easy number to remember. But but we had we had a wonderful manager, Bill Lazarus, may he rest in peace. And you remember Bill. And Bill yeah. was a great teacher. And all he wanted us to do was touch the buttons all the time. And 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 on weekends, go in there, do everything. Make sure the sessions are ready on Monday or I'll kill you guys. But he was, he was really great about it. It's hard to, you know, one thing, I guess it's more philosophical in life. You, you have to love it. Hopefully you love what you do so you don't have to go to work every day. And, you know, but I find in this business, no one ever has enough money to do things right. But they always find enough money to fucking fix it, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They always yeah. find enough money. So you never have, okay, so... It's it, it, it runs rampant in, you know, in music, but there are a lot of people that still perceive what we do as an art form and they would do anything to make their music sound better. Those are the clients, of course, that we love. You can find out more about Gary at GaryLuxMusic.com. That's Gary Lux, G-A-R-Y-L-U-X, music, all one word. Com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyoinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-in form for my newsletter and for alerts to new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Bye.